Uh, welcome to the Computational so Social Science Forum. Um, today, our format is a little bit different than it has been the past, uh, the, the, well, the whole prior rest of the semester, uh, and that we're going to have more uh, of a discussion with our, um, our authors here. Um, and so first, let me uh, introduce our, our two guests who um, have graciously agreed to join us and, and talk through uh, some of these issues around risk instruments in the criminal justice system. Uh, Jennifer Scheme is a professor in the School of Social Welfare and the School of Public Policy uh, here at Berkeley. And uh, Chris Slobogan is a professor at Vanderbilt Law School. And I think Jen is going to start us off with some a few remarks, and then maybe we'll give uh, Chris a chance to make some remarks if he'd like, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and so we'll do our usual, we'll try our usual technique for quest questions and handing off the floor, which is you can either put a question or a comment um, in the chat, uh, or um, or you can um, just write stack or write your name uh, if you'd like the floor, and then you can, of course then. Uh, then ask your question or make your comment. Um, so, without further ado, let's uh, let's get started. Okay, great. Thank you for the introduction, David, and and thanks for having us. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, the reading is actually a pretty broad introduction to the topic of risk assessment. And just to give you a little bit of an orientation about um, the take that that I and that Christopher have, um, we, we wrote this chapter with some computer science colleagues and, you know, increasingly a lot of these issues regarding risk assessment have been taken up into this terrain. So now we're here in this computational social science forum, which makes perfect sense. Um, and I guess the first and most important thing to understand about our chapter and the partnership is that we've been, Chris and I have been studying and <laughs> studying broadly, you know, from a legal perspective and from a psychological and social science perspective, we've been studying risk assessment for decades. And there's been um, some change in the terrain, some welcome change in the terrain with the advent of big data and algorithms and, you know, everything is much more accessible than it used to be in terms of building risk assessments. So I guess I would say that in the way of providing context. Um, I will say a little bit about what risk assessment instruments are before we probably, we're probably going to focus much more on algorithms specifically given this group's interests. But I wanted to say a little bit about the risk assessment terrain first, and then let Chris talk about the legal context, which is really important. And also mention a, a book that he's written recently that walks through all of these issues in much more depth if you're interested. Um, in terms of the terrain, risk assessment instruments encompass a huge array of tools and technology. And it ranges from everything as simple as a checklist of risk factors. And by risk factor, I just mean something that precedes and increases the likelihood of criminal behavior. So it ranges from simple mnemonics or checklists that a clinician or probation officer may keep at their desk when they're interviewing somebody on probation or when they're interviewing somebody else that, that just kind of structures their thinking. So they're sure to ask people the same general types of things and to pay attention to the same kinds of risk factors. Um, when they're trying to predict whether someone is likely to be involved in crime in the future. So that's one, one end of the spectrum. I'm not including seat of the pants intuition or judgment because that frankly is what is most often used in the justice system when you're not talking about risk assessment instruments. So seat of the pants intuitive human judgment doesn't do any of that, right? So there's no checklist, there's no mnemonics. It's just kind of an intuitive professional um, sense of whether the person's likely to be um, reoffending or not. 
So for risk assessment instruments, everything from checklist through to more formalized sort of, you would think of them as psychological tests where you may be interviewing someone, you may be reviewing their rap sheet and their criminal record, you may be interviewing collateral informants and then scoring people on different risk factors and adding up the score, right, as kind of a clinical um, <laughs> slash structured risk assessment process. So we've got checklists, we have these sort of psychological tests that mix together what we know about robust risk factors for recidivism with um, state-of-the-art reliability and validity, validity tests from kind of a psychological science perspective, all the way up through purely actuarial tools, which are really when, when we're talking more in the classic algorithm sense. So those instruments can be built with a variety of data sets. Um, data sets that they're often built with are, you know, increasingly they're administrative data sets, but in those administrative data sets, you can have everything from probationers and clinicians assessments that would look kind of like the risk factors that I just talked about to completely automated rap sheets or criminal history information. So when we're talking about risk assessment instruments, there's a huge range in terms of how much you are structuring or replacing human judgment with statistics, algorithms, et cetera. And that goes right up through the final determination of whether someone's low or medium or high risk or whether they should be released pretrial or not. Those, those latter decisions are almost always still human decisions though which is an important issue because we have very little science still that pays attention to the human in the equation, right? How humans use these risk estimates and how that affects, well, we know it doesn't affect accuracy well, but how, how it affects especially bias and other outcomes. So, um, so the first point of, of context is just that we're talking about a huge array of tools and technology when, when we're talking about risk assessment instruments. Um, and I'll say two other really quick points of context. The second point is that risk assessment has always been part of the criminal justice system. It's, it's been around for a long, long time. It has helped people make decisions about everything from how do we classify people in a prison to make sure that those who are most dangerous to each other are held more securely and those least dangerous can have more freedom um, to what kind of treatment and services to provide to people on probation and parole. So risk assessment has been part of the mix for a long, long time. It's just become much more high profile with a lot of recent events. Um, and the third thing I was gonna say is escaping me now. Oh, is that we know a lot about accuracy and we know less about bias. So one of the things we've known since Paul Meal's work in the 1950s is that we do better if we're interested in accurate predictions when we either structure people's judgment or we replace it with an algorithm. So I think um, we, we've, even though there's a lot of debate now about accuracy and some risk assessment instruments are definitely better than others. Um, I think that uh, th we can talk pretty quickly about some of the accuracy issues and not so quickly about some of the bias and legal and ethical and other issues. So that's my sort of long rambling contextual frame. And Chris will provide much more astute observations. Uh, not likely, but I, I am legally trained, so let me get that uh, out up front. Uh, my comments will be um, legally oriented. And Jennifer mentioned this book, and I was told I should mention it, even though it's not coming out until May, so you all forget the title by then. But in any event, the title is just Algorithms, colon, you always have to have a colon, uh, reduce, Using Science to Reduce Incarceration and Inform a Jurisprudence of Risk. And I think uh, one reason I want to tell you the title, it's, it's certainly not to sell any books because it's not going to come out till May. It's because that title actually summarizes what I would want to say in the way of context. Jennifer is right. 
that the main debate lately has been about the fairness of these algorithms, these risk assessment instruments. And so that's why I start off my title with just algorithms. I think algorithms can be just, they can be fair. And one reason I make a case for algorithms, risk, risk assessment instruments, assuming they're properly regulated, is that I think it can help deal with the central problem in criminal justice today, which is mass incarceration. Everybody, conservatives and liberals alike, think there are way too many in prison, whether it's pretrial or post-conviction. And there are lots of different suggestions being made for how to take care of that problem, shorter sentences, decriminalization, intermediate sanctions, and so on. But one of the premises of my book, and I think what a lot of people think, not just me, is none of those alternatives are going to do any good unless we can assure the public that the quote unquote most dangerous people will still be detained and that will only let out lower risk or medium risk people. And that's where these algorithms or risk assessment instruments come in, or at least from a legal perspective, they can help us differentiate between the higher risk and the lower risk people. So that's the legal argument for using them. Um, but despite that argument, which I think is a fairly plausible one, it's very fashionable in legal academia right now to hate algorithms with a passion. Um, you hear uh, lots of different kinds of attacks. One is on accuracy. Jen dealt with that briefly, and I think she's right that they are, compared to humans, more accurate. Another is, though, they don't really answer the questions the law wants answered. And then the third has to do generally with fairness, uh, racial bias, gender bias, um, procedural injustice, and so on. There is, just to give you one example, let's see if I can I pull it up while Jen was talking. Um, I'll just read you two different comments. Um, in 2019, over 110 civil rights groups signed a statement calling for an end to pretrial risk assessment instruments. That same year, 27 Ivy League and MIT academics stated that, quote, technical problems with risk assessment instruments, quote, cannot be resolved. And finally, in 2000, this is my favorite, in 2020, another group of 2,323 scholars from a wide range of disciplines, quote, unquote, demanded, close quote, that Springer Publishing Company, which you all know, I'm sure, quote, issue a statement condemning the use of criminal justice statistics to predict criminality. And that was directly aimed at these risk assessment instruments. So uh, a lot of people think we shouldn't even be talking about this, that it's not something that the criminal justice system should be contemplating. What we did in the article that I think many of you read um, was address that, uh, the various complaints. Um, in my book, I, I address the same complaints. I label them the fit complaint, that is that these instruments don't address the issues that law wants addressed, the validity complaint, complaint, which is about accuracy, and then the fairness complaint. And I'll stop there. I mean, there's lots more to be said, obviously, but um, just to give you an idea of the legal perspective on this, I think that's enough. I guess one very broad question I had is, um, you know, in the kind of fairness in machine learning literature, there's this kind of idea that the first thing we ought to do is think about when do we want to use um, an algorithm versus not. And you've made the argument that, well, we're already making risk assessments. They're done poorly by humans if they're on their own and unstructured. Um, and so, you know, an algorithm will improve on that. Um, I guess the, the question is maybe to ask you to maybe think, zoom back up like yet another step and say, you know, are we, um, are we in a sense like sort of predetermining part of the answer to a larger question when we jump right into using an algorithm? So for example, like, which is that, you know, should, should we be regularly doing some of the things that the criminal justice system does, period, right? I mean, I think the place that intersects with this the most is uh, around pretrial detention, right? Where one version is like we assign pretrial detention based on risk algorithm versus just the judge's hunch <laughs> or the prosecutor's demand. Um, but Another argument is we should almost, we should very rarely be using pretrial detention at all. Um, and diving into the algorithm question just sort of presupposes the answer to that without us uh, having thought too carefully about it. Um, I, I have a, a response, Chris. I don't, 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I I think that's such an important uh, question to raise and a wise way to begin the conversation. Uh, I think that if we are interested in prediction, if if part of the legal and policy question involves public safety and trying to protect it, which means that we are trying to identify the, the few people who are likely to reoffend from those who are not, then I do think that algorithms can be useful and will be more useful demonstrably than seat of the pants human judgment and could help you know, these are all of the arguments that you hear advocates of risk assessment introduce. It, it helps with um, increased transparency, as, assuming that you've insisted on that in building your alg algorithm. So it, it helps with transparency, it helps with consistency, it helps um, with accuracy. So I, I do think that algorithms have something to offer if, if, we are trying to forecast recidivism and that's an essential part of the question that we're answering from a legal or policy perspective. Having said that, I don't think that this is restricted to a detention decision necessarily. I think a lot of, a lot of the way that we can trouble and, and have trouble clawing our way out of debate about these issues is that we assume that the, the reason we're assessing risk is so we can identify the few bad people to continue incarceration for. When in fact, there are a variety of ways that you could translate those risk classifications into other decisions. So some jurisdictions could view a high risk classification at the pretrial stage, for example, as an indication that supports need to be provided. So maybe this is the person for whom text message reminders about their court dates are appropriate, for whom you know bus passes or internet access in today's world, right? If you have to zoom into your court appointment, you know, making sure that you've got those supports. So I I, I view the the policy decisions as differentiated from the the use the, the prediction you know so so when when prediction is part of the equation I do think the algorithms are going to be helpful and I think that what you do with people who are relatively likely not to appear for their appointment or to reoffend that's a different question and we could do a lot of things differently from a reform perspective in the justice system, it's, it should be much more than incarceration, I think. Yeah, from a legal perspective, obviously that's the predicate question. Is risk ever a legitimate issue in criminal justice? And there's a huge literature on that. Uh, in the pretrial context, a lot of people said, let's forget about risk assessment entirely. Let's just say only people charged with very serious crimes, murder, rape, and armed robbery, can be detained at all prior to trial. Everyone else gets let go. No risk assessment whatsoever. That is certainly a viable approach. That's sort of the approach New York State took earlier this year. But at least according to the police, and there's a major caveat there because it's according to the police, crime rates went way up when New York implemented that plan. And so New York basically reversed itself within three months. In New Jersey, which used risk assessment instruments, and train the judges how to use them, they are releasing many, many more people than they used to, and crime rates have not gone up. So the policy argument is actually it's better to go with risk assessment, both because it's, it's a better differentiator in terms of who we want to release and who we don't, who we want to get support for and who we don't, and also because um, the public won't put up with a non-risk-based approach. At sentencing, it's even more fraught. It's even a more fraught issue with some scholars and academics and some legislators saying, in fact, the federal government said at one point, risk should be irrelevant at sentencing. The only issue should be just desert, backward looking assessments of culpability. No sentence should be based on forward looking assessments of risk. 
and I could go on and on about this. Uh, what I talk about in my book is that you think we're bad at risk assessment. We're horrible at culpability assessment. We have no idea how to define or evaluate blameworthiness. And there are other things to say as well. But so there's an ongoing debate. You're absolutely right to ask the question. I think that our responses, and in fact, there's some good arguments we made, the risk assessment should have a pretty significant role to play, both pretrial and post-conviction. Let, let me say one other thing. Uh, maybe it'll trigger some, not about fairness, which I think is, again, the most controversial thing. But one thing that is very disturbing, I think, is that a lot of law people don't make an effort to tell social scientists and computer scientists what they want in terms of information about risk. Um, they either don't think about it at all, they take something off the shelf, which often does not really meet legal needs. That's why the last part of my book title is uh, Using Science to Inform a Jurisprudence of Risk. There are literally tens of thousands of pages written about the definition of culpability. We're still not good at figuring out who's culpable and who isn't, but we've got at least a lot of literature helping us figure out the difference between first degree murder, second degree murder, and so on. There is, by comparison, very little literature on what I call a jurisprudence of risk. There's been very little effort by the by the Supreme Court on down, and including I'm I'm including academia in this, not just the courts, in defining what probability of what outcome during what time period in the absence of what intervention we're willing to do anything to anybody. There's just no law on that. We've defined murder out the wazoo, but we have not done a good job defining what we mean by risk legally. So I think that we shouldn't be trying to build algorithms to predict things that are subject to a lot of selection bias. And by that, so this, this one of the main objections to risk assessment in criminal justice revolves around how some of the most actuarial, like truly algorithmic tools have been built. The, the concern is that you will have biased predictors predicting a biased criterion. So if we're largely using indices of criminal history to predict reoffending or, or worse than that, to predict arrest for a drug offense. We know that police selection plays a role in those indices, both the predictor and the criterion. And so what we are predicting is sort of biased decision-making. So the complaint is that you, you just get a ratchet effect where you're subjecting the same people to the same outcomes over and over again. Um, so I, I think in terms of what we should predict, what we should strive to predict is uh, whatever it is that we care about preventing and what we've tended to focus on in our sort of big data projects is arrest for a violent offense. That's not a perfect criterion, but it is much less subject to selection bias than say arrest for a drug crime or arrest for just any crime in general. And Al Bloomstein and others have done some work to show that you know, there's some evidence that racial profiles for victimization reports for violence follow the same patterns as those for arrests for violence. So we, we try to use that as what we're trying to predict because when people are interested in public safety, that's one of that's one of the outcomes that they most care about predicting and preventing. So when we're doing, um, when, when we are focused on algorithmic risk, risk assessment and trying to predict things, we tend to focus on violence. I think that, you know, to the extent that you could build a criterion for any kind of new offending that you want to prevent, that would be great. It's just that people, it, it's expensive and intensive and a heavy lift and probably jurisdiction specific to go out and interview 
people who may be offending victims and you know sort of intersect that with arrest records to get at a perfect criterion but that's really what i would love to see is that we have real trustworthy criterion variables that we're predicting because that helps take care a lot that that help that helps take care of some of the feature bias or the predictor variable biases if if what we're predicting is something that we have a lot of faith in as a measure of actual offending that we want to prevent. Um, so that that was longer than I intended it for it to be, but I, I think that in terms of what we're trying to predict, we what you're raising is a really important question, and some criterion variables are much more suspect than others. Um, failure to appear is kind of a, it's a squishy thing to predict, but at least it's specific. Um, the, the other, and I'll speak just briefly to the other point that you raised. I think the other point you raised is that uh, the way that I view it is that there are things, there's behaviors that you can predict and algorithms are well built for that. But when you are making a judgment, a legal judgment, it it's, Chris and I probably differ on this, but it's rarely reducible to a number or a figure or whatever the output of the algorithm is. Typically, a human has to make the decision about whether the person is going to be released or retained, detained. Um, but the hope is that the algorithm helps helps them understand the dangerousness part of the equation and it's their job to consider other factors like who who will go hungry if this person is detained or you know what any other factors that go into the legal decision about pretrial release i agree with that last part i mean i think from a legal perspective again that's going to be the perspective i take um i think it should be inappropriate illegal illegitimate to detain someone if what you're predicting is a commit a misdemeanor or a low level drug offense within the next six months, year or two years. So Jennifer answered your question from an empirical perspective and, and she used, she talked about criterion variables in terms of what an empiricist would prefer. As a normative legal matter, we should not be putting people in detention because we think there's a 30% chance of commit a misdemeanor. And yet that's what some of these risk assessment instruments do. Um, so the, one of the most famous actuarial instruments is something called the Violence Risk Appraisal Guide. The outcome measure there was one simple assault. I don't care if there's a 70% chance a person will commit a simple assault within a year, that should not be grounds for detention. That's a normative point I'm making, not an empirical one, but it's coincident or it's consistent with the kinds of things that Jen is saying. It has the added benefit of not using arrest for low-level crimes as the criterion variable. Um, but I think normatively, we shouldn't, even if we could, get that kind of data. That's, again, a jurisprudence of risk that would help people like Jen come up with actual instruments um, that are useful to the law. And then and the other consequence of that definition is that, as Jen can tell you, and you probably can intuit, the base rate for violent crime defined as real violence is incredibly low, which means what? Almost everyone will be considered low risk if that's your definition. And that I think is a fine result. As Jen said, the public's mostly con uh, concerned about violent crime. Even if you say as low as 30% chance of, of violent crime, the base rate for that's gonna be incredibly low. And those are the only people that special steps should be taken for in terms of either pretrial attention or what's done post-conviction if the focus is risk. That's at least, that's my normative prior. One last thing as, as far as um, criterion variable, uh, I love Sandy Mason, someone who writes in this area a lot. And she's very clear, and this is starting to blend into the fairness issue, which I think we probably wanna to talk to it some, uh, talk about in, uh, in more um, concretely at some point. She says in New Orleans, when an, an, a black individual had three arrests, ah, no big deal. When a white person has three arrests, that's a bad dude. And it sort of summarizes, I think, the kind of thing that Jen has been talking about, why we need to be careful in terms of criterion variables. 
So one thing that, to make very clear, Loomis and the other cases like it are very unclear about what they mean about how the risk assessment results should only be one factor. If what they're saying is when you're deciding how long to sentence someone, you consider risk, but you also consider culpability and deterrence. That's one thing, okay? And that's fine. I think that way that should be handled is you set your sentence range based on deterrence and culpability. And then within that range, you base the sentence entirely on risk. That gets to the second interpretation of what you're talking about. If you're just looking at risk within that range, should you only look at the results of the risk assessment instrument or you should, or should you let the human muck around with the results? And as you imply, and as we say in our article, that can be dangerous in the uh, normative sense. In other words, humans can really mess things up if they start going with intuition. And I think if I'm a defense attorney, I'm particularly worried because judges, it's been shown over and over again, when they second guess an algorithm, they tend to adjust upward. Why? Because, hey, I've got this risk score and he's medium risk, but I know he's committed three offenses. So I'm going to add some years to his sentence. Of course, the risk assessment, is, if it's worth his salt, has already taken into account criminal history. So that's double counting. Big boo boo. That should not happen. My overall approach is the risk assessment instrument results, assuming it's a good one, and that's a big assumption, but assuming it's a good one, ought to be presumptive. And only if there are some idiosyncratic or other kinds of factors that were not considered in developing the instrument, should those be used to, in the Bayesian way, as you put it, to adjust upward or downward. And that, that should be a pretty rare event, depending on how good and comprehensive the risk assessment instrument is. Um, because otherwise, why use the risk assessment instrument? If you just say to the judge, hey, look at it, but you can disregard it, you can adjust upward, you can adjust downward, go, go with whatever you think is right. I don't see any point in using an instrument then. I have little to add to that. I, I think that what I will add is that I there's so much confusion in this space that boils down to conflating two things with each other. One is risk. How likely is this person to reoffend in the future violently, let's say. Risk is different than blame. How culpable is this person for this offense? They're two different things. And they get conflated because, you know, I, I sat in sentencing commission meetings where they have this conversation and sort of decide that they're really suspicious about almost everything in the risk algorithm except for criminal history. Because, why? Be because that seems to speak both to risk and blameworthiness. They both go in the same direction, right? If, if you, uh, have criminal history, you're probably more culpable for this particular act. But there are also variables that work at odds with each other, right? Do you have a history of trauma that works in opposite directions for risk and blameworthiness? So it's just, it's really, really important to distinguish between those two enterprises of predicting future recidivism and assigning culpability for a fast, for, for a past offense. They, they get mixed up um, far too often. So I think that in, a deal, in an ideal world, using the model that Chris just explicated, you know, limited retributivism, right? So you decide what the, what the sentencing range is based on the person's moral culpability. And that's where the human comes in. That's where empathy, that's where mitigating factors, that's where we can, you know, really talk um, about blameworthiness so that sets a range within which risk plays a role. So once you have that, um, I, I tend to be in agreement that if you have a good, fair risk assessment instrument that has been implemented faithfully, then you should go with that estimate rather than tinker with it, but with overrides or adjustments or whatever, because there, there is a fairly big literature that suggests that those overrides mean that you, you are going to move backwards on the accuracy front. 
Those are tough questions, uh, and I appreciate your asking them. Fairness is it's the hardest conversation to have because I think I think Sherrod's group has put it the best way. Um, they have an op-ed that I think I've shared already with you. I can put it in the chat later. But in, in the op-ed, they explain the problem of inframarginality in a way that is really accessible. So they basically explain this conundrum of uh, you, can't, you can't be fair in two ways at once when it comes to this business. So if, if you have a higher base rate of, let's say, violent offending, you have a higher rate of violent offending in one group than another group. And you have an algorithm that's well calibrated to those actual differences in outcomes, meaning that a given score on that algorithm translates to the same probability of violent reoffending, whether the person belongs to one group or another. You will find that there's imbalance in error rates. So one group will have a higher false positive rate than another group. So what that means is of the group who doesn't reoffend, a larger proportion of them will have been classified as high risk in the group with the higher reoffending rate than those in the other group. Does that make sense? I, I think I, I can yeah. see a few faces. <laughs> All right, so so that's the problem that it it's it is impossible to be fair in both ways at once. The thing that I try to share with people, um, uh, so judges or sending sen sentencing commissions is that that is a true, that is a mathematical truism. It doesn't, you don't get around that by having the human make the decision instead of, you know, no, sorry. The human's gonna make the decision, but you don't get around that prediction problem by having the human do the prediction instead of having the algorithm do the prediction. What you lose in the process of just leaving it to the human is accuracy, the, the actual, the calibration, because humans are really poor at reliably like rank ordering people in terms of their likelihood of reoffending. And they almost always over predict that that's consistently the direction that they go. So I, I just try to provide explainers that leverage uh, Sherrod's work and also show them in their data what the trade-offs look like, because often they have, um, they have uh, an exaggerated sense of the imbalance that you get in false positives. You, you could have really concerning imbalance in some cases, and I think there's always reason to pay attention to that and try to shore up the algorithm if you can to get better precision and more balance. But at the end of the day, there's, there isn't a way of changing that mathematical reality. There's no way, and it, you, can't, you can't get around it. Um, and the second point, how do you translate that estimate to a human decision? I don't know yet. I, I mean, I, there are some decision supports, right? Arnold Ventures has put out one around their pretrial risk assessment. They have a huge national project going on right now that's trying to get a sense for the parameters under which that decision support tool is helpful or not to, helpful. But I, there's so little research right now on how you get the human into the mix in an effective way that I, I can't answer that question in a way that feels comfortable. So again, from a legal perspective, the ProPublica study that Jen just described um, created a lot of controversy. Um, I talk about it at, at some length in what I sent in the chat. Um, which is followed by the article, the ProPublica article that Aniket just sent out and that Jen just referenced. So you got two references there. The latter one is the ProPublica piece and the response to it. And then the primer that I have there, you have the link to, talks about the legal issues. And the bottom line legal issue is with respect to ProPublica's argument, you can't do it and still be constitutional. What ProPublica said is, 
it's unfair to have a higher black false positive rate. So what we got to do is either raise, change the cutoffs so that there are more white false positives or um, in some other way equalize false positives and false negatives between the races. And first of all, you probably can't do both. You're going to skew either false negatives or false positives if you equalize one, you're going to screw up the other one. But in addition, uh, as a legal matter, that would be a violation of what lawyers call the anti-classification principle. You're using race to classify, and you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. Now, a lot of people argue that's the wrong way to think about the Equal Protection Clause, but nonetheless, it is a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, but from an empirical point of view, the other reason not to do what ProPublica says is what Jen inferred, that you're more inaccurate. You're less accurate if you do that. You're uh, ruining the calibration of the instrument. So if you can somehow make that clear to the lawyers and judges, that's helpful. And you can also tell defense attorneys, look, if the cutoff is placed at the right point, where I think it should be, most people will be released. So stop fighting these things. It's what's going on now with our risk assessment instruments is a lot worse than if you had risk assessment instruments that had the right cutoff score. And what you tell prosecutors is, look, it's all about public safety. And we're helping you differentiate between the risky and the non-risky. So go with it. And it's working in New Jersey. It should work in other places. And it's true, Jen says there's not a lot of research, but the Arnold Foundation is starting to generate research, which tends to support what I just got through saying. As to how do you, how do you integrate, integrate human decision-making with this, I've already suggested, I think the results of the instrument should be presumptive. And you only get to adjust it upwards or downwards on the risk issue. Just looking at risk, nothing else on the risk issue. If there's a very idiosyncratic or unusual um, factor that's not considered in the instrument in any way, um, that's the only way you're going to achieve any kind of effect using these instruments. One other thing we talked about race, there's also the gender issue. And I'm sure Anakin knows this because he teaches Loomis. Uh, because the argument made there was that the compass which is the instrument that was at issue in the Loomis case. And by the way, for those of you who care about this, Loomis is right now the leading case on this stuff, unfortunately. Um, what Loomis held was it's okay to use an instrument that explicitly differentiates between women and men. Um, and it did that on, on an empirical basis, basically, that if we don't do that, women are gonna be seen as riskier or men are gonna be seen as less risky than they actually are so that there should be some sex conscious aspects of these instruments. Um, technically that violates the same principle I talked about before, the equal protection principle called the anti-classification principle. So it gets very complicated very quickly. I have some thoughts about how we should deal with that, but I'm not gonna go into them now. Uh, the primer does that and, and so does my book. And, and just one quick writer on that. We could get really pointy headed about this really quickly. Loomis does not talk about these issues at the level that we need to understand for building right. algorithms, which is a whole different uh, subject. I, we, we've got a paper just out where we try to struggle with some of those issues, but some problems actually are solved by setting different thresholds for high risk by group. And it's not even clear from Loomis, Loomis or, or <laughs> others, whether that would fly and, you know, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that and then make one, one other comment, which is to Alyssa's question. I think that the really useful thing that algorithms do is they, they force a conversation with the people that you're talking with, right? So there's a whole pretrial group and they have to have some hard conversations about what level of risk they're willing to tolerate for what kind of reoffending. And, and those, those are human policy, moral decisions that have to be made that, that will never be made by algorithms. And, and they're scared to do it because they're elected officials. Imagine saying from now on, we're gonna release everyone who doesn't have a 30% or more probability of committing a violent crime within the next six months. But you got to. One other thing, Jen mentioned taking race or gender into account in developing these instruments. That's different than what ProPublica wants to do. ProPublica wants to, to essentially manipulate false positive and false negative rates. But if instead you develop separate instruments 
for blacks as opposed to whites, separate instruments for women as opposed to men. That's taking race and gender into account, but in order to improve accuracy, not to diminish it. And that makes a big difference, in my opinion. <clears throat> Yeah, that's what the primer is meant to do, but you're absolutely right. It's a preliminary kind of thing. I'm sure in three years, it'll be totally rewritten, but that's what the primer is trying to do in terms of how to deal with this stuff. You know, Jen and I love to, to ask this question, compared to what? If you don't have instruments, what are you going to do? You're going to rely on seat of the pants assessments, which will probably dominated by criminal history. Criminal history is totally biased um, in terms of race and in terms of gender. If you believe in structural racism, then a lot of criminal histories are at least in a very indirect sense, result of racism. So what, you get rid of criminal history as relevant to the criminal justice system? That's not gonna happen. If it's not relevant to risk, it's gonna be relevant to culpability. In other words, the person who's committed three crimes is more evil than the person who's only committed two is more evil than person's only committed one. So criminal history is going to be considered. And the argument in favor of algorithms is, at least as Jenna said, they're more transparent. You can correct for at least some of the bias by changing your criterion variables with the realization in mind that policing can skew those variables. And the various other things you can do. Jen's written a paper that tries to deal with some of the structural racism aspects to the system. And it's very difficult to do if you're dealing instead with humans. Implicit bias, by definition, you don't know if it exists. And if you do know it exists, how do you get rid of it? And how do you know that you've gotten rid of it? Et cetera, et cetera. I, I love that question. I love all of these questions. These are just phenomenal. Um, two, two responses. One is to just underscore compared to what, right? So the use of algorithms in making criminal justice decisions compared to what existing practices. So without the benefit of algorithms, we're in a place where a young black man is six times or more, more likely to be incarcerated than a young white man. So some of that is based on sentencing guidelines that uh, really heavily emphasize criminal history. We know that can and does contribute to disparities in the justice system. Part of it is based on, um, it, it's not judicial bias as much as bias in policing practices first and foremost, but it goes on down the chain, charging practices, um, sentences, et cetera. So I, I think that it's not, fair to hold the, the algorithm up for a beating without considering where we are now. And more importantly, without considering how this could help. So Kleinberg, I, I put a link here in the chat, has written, you know, you may not agree with all of the points made in this paper, but makes a pretty compelling case, I think, for algorithms as a potential tool for addressing over time um, some, some of the very disparities that we're concerned about creating, baking and bias, et cetera. So the entire premise is that this is a regime where algorithms are carefully vetted, carefully regulated, looked at over time, and used to affect improvements over time in, in a, a wide variety of policy areas, not just criminal justice, but in, in others as well. So I, I find that argument interesting and something that we should attend to because, you know, as, as Chris says, the, the difference you could argue between existing practices and algorith algorithms is that algorithms can wear the biases on their face. So we can look at them, we can see how they're functioning, we can see what goes into them, we can decide that we want criminal history to be emphasized far less in some of the tools or technology that we're using. So I think that um, with a lot of regulation that, that no, this is not, it's the opposite of putting the white flag up. It, it's trying to figure out how we can and should do something different as one of two bookends. The other bookend is actually doing different things. I mean, stopping incarcerating and starting to try 
other things, um, including interventions and supports. And in terms of a cookbook, we there there are some some things that are coming out. So Chris put his guide up. I know that um, Sherrod Boyle at Stanford is running a computational social science lab and they're working with a lot of different agencies trying to get to a place where there are more guides and guidelines. Um, and there are some foundations that are interested in supporting all of these efforts too. I think the, the, the challenge is to reach consensus about some of those or decide what the accrediting body is because it's not at all clear right now. Uh, the Council for State Governments has just come out with something as well, uh, meant to be a guideline for empiricists as opposed to legal folks. Cool. There are two things in the chat I want to briefly say something about. Lisa asked a question about cash bail. Um, I, if you have good risk assessment instruments, you should get rid of cash bail. Cash bail doesn't make any sense um, if you've got risk assessment instruments. A very short answer, but that's all I'll say about it. Um, the second thing that uh, is it Suchitra mentions is uh, causal monitoring, ca causal model modeling. And what I want to riff on based on that is that one of the problems with algorithms, and I think it's a very real problem. In fact, I think it's the most serious problem there is, and we have not yet talked about it, is this sense of robot justice. I guess we sort of alluded to it with the empathy point. The idea, the defendant's there in front of a judge and is told, well, you've got a score of 10, you're staying in jail. So it might not be that blatant, but it's something along those lines. If I'm a defendant, I'm outraged. I say, what do you mean? I mean, I, I, I don't get to make any arguments or maybe I do, but you're gonna go with this presumptively unless I have really good arguments as to why this shouldn't be followed. That's just unfair, it's procedurally unjust. And I, I understand that argument completely. As a, as a fan of good algorithms, this is the argument that concerns me the most against them. And I think one thing that can be done, and this is why I'm using the causal modeling phrase to make this comment, is the extent that there can be theories behind the risk factors in these instruments. And those theories can be explained to defendants and defense attorneys and prosecutors the better this will work because it won't be as robotic. There'll be some explanation for why there's a high, medium, or low risk score. Right now, we don't, as Jen's pointed out in some of her work, we don't have very good research on what's causal as opposed to just correlational. And I think it'd be very useful to have more. Implementation is a huge, 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 huge issue across criminal justice settings. It doesn't matter if you're talking about corrections, so probation, parole officers. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to Chris to talk about some of the studies of judges and their take on risk assessment. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really difficult. Um, luckily, there's a whole there's a whole class of people who study implementation issues in corrections. So at least when you're talking about probation and parole, which is where a lot of the risk assessment gets done, um, there's, there are enterprises and more importantly, some scholars and scholarly groups that are focused on how you, how you get past this idea that you do a one and done training, that you just drop it and it suddenly becomes something that everybody does competently and with enthusiasm and instead work with agencies over time to achieve buy-in and ownership and then go even further to ensure that you go beyond training to coaching and conversation and um, that you are checking to make sure that you're not getting drift over time. So this is a, I, I can send you specific references if you're interested, but there, there are lots of people studying implementation, it is really, really hard to achieve. And it can be done, but it's really hard to achieve. And I would say very, very few agencies invest in it to the level that they need to. I agree with what Jen just said. There's a special issue behavioral science and law coming out on implementation issues. But I think the bottom line of that issue is 
what Jen just said, what Jen said, it's difficult <laughs> to implement. Um, as to what judges think, since ju uh, Jen's um, referenced those studies, there's a lot of interesting research out of Virginia. On the one hand, you have judges saying, I don't do voodoo, referring to risk assessment instruments. And on the other, you have judges saying, I love these instruments because when I lower the sentence of a sexually violent predator, I can point to the algorithm and blame it and hopefully get reelected because I'll be able to say, hey, the algorithm made me do it. It wasn't really my decision. <laughs> this, of course, is also being, some profiles, algorithms are being used by the police. And I, we're not gonna talk about the here I don't think, but I am much more hostile to algorithms used by police than I am by pre-trial detention decision makers and judges at sentencing and correctional officials. One way of doing it is for the state to mandate it. Uh, the Supreme Court has mandated a definition of intellectual disability in the death penalty context. A legislature or court could mandate an instrument. I doubt seriously that would work very well. It probably wouldn't just be one instrument. There might be a slew of instruments. More likely, there would be a statute that sets out a procedure for making sure an instrument is valid and fits the legal questions being raised. And they wouldn't just pick one instrument. Though I know some jurisdictions have done that. I don't think that's the right way to go. In terms of transparency, another reason Loomis is, un it's unfortunate that Loomis is the leading case is it upheld the trade secret argument made by what used to be called North Point is now called Equivant. It's a company that developed Compass. And of course it's unfortunate because we don't know what the algorithm is underlying the Compass as a result of that decision. It still has not been revealed. A, a co-author and I tried to reverse engineer it and we did figure out that youth is a hugely relevant risk factor, but we still don't know precisely what is involved with that instrument. And I, I won't go into detail now, but I think there are some very strong legal arguments that it's unconstitutional to not reveal not only the risk factors, but the weights assigned various risk factors because defense attorneys and prosecutors and judges need to know what those are for lots of reasons, which again, I won't go into, uh, but they have to do with right of confrontation, which some of you have probably heard of under in the Sixth Amendment, you have a right to confront your accusers. There's also a very famous case that defendants have a right to know the identities of confidential informants who are, whose evidence is being used against them. I think that's directly analogous to what we're talking about. Just a couple of quick impressions. So for, there are two pieces, I think, to, to what you raised. Um, both of which are important. So the going back to the implementation issues, one thing I wanted to flag that you were you were suggesting is that there are different degrees of implementation difficulties that depend on how much the algorithm depends on humans for scoring and for uh, and for by scoring, I mean scoring at the risk factor level, scoring at the adding it up level. So the more automated it is, the less intensity of training issues that you have, at least around competency. There are still lots of implementation issues that go into buy-in, credibility, et cetera. So I just wanted to underscore that, that you raised an important point there. The second thing about um, implementation is that I think there will have to be some diversity of instruments. It's not, I, I don't think we're gonna have a one size fits all jurisdictions because there are, I would imagine um, differences in the predictive utility of some factors as a function of where people are and what the context might be, which is you know, sort of a different topic. And the last thing I wanted to say is that there's, there's this issue with transparency. Um, I hesitate to raise it because it complicates everything, but when you, when you provide us human beings with more disaggregated information about risk, we tend to view the person as riskier than when all you provide is a number or a risk classification. So even though we want to be as transparent as possible and show the human, here are the risk factors, here's how they were weighted and there's where we wound up. When that human sees things like poverty and they've already, well, it's not poverty, they, they may see just the risk score. We've done experiments with judges where we've seen that that interacts. 
with the um, defendant socioeconomic status so that they view the risk score as much worse if we're talking about a, a very poor defendant compared to someone who's better off with the same same risk score, same risk factors, et cetera. So it, it's just to say that it, it's complicated, this issue of wanting to achieve transparency, but always having a human in the loop. We need all of you smart people here to contribute because it will it, it's going to take a lot of research. I know of you know several people who are trying to undertake different approaches. So some of what we've done, for example, are um, like vignette based experiments with judges, which you know we're trying to get a sense for how risk information can interact with race or socioeconomic status. Others are trying to use data to understand, like one of, one of the really important points of information that we need to get is whether having decision tools, right? So if we can, if we think of risk assessment as a decision tool, whether relying on those decision tools more in these sort of gray area cases actually reduces racial bias or racial disparities I, we don't have time to go into it, but there's there's really beautiful classic evidence in the death penalty literature that when you that if if you've got more structure in those gray area territories, it may actually be helpful. But we have a long way to go before we understand the different conditions of interaction and how to make them optimal. Um, the only thing I'll add is. So it picks up on what I said before. If it's, there's a concern about implementation at the courtroom or prison level, you have an independent body look at the risk factors and their weights and decide whether or not the legitimate risk factors constitutionally and otherwise, and whether the instrument is in fact valid. And then it's distributed to the relevant decision makers who, if it's considered to be a bad thing, are not allowed to look under the hood. All they get is the risk score. That's done in, by the way, a lot of different areas, uh, not just here. Um, and I think, I, I talk about this in the primary. Um, there's an administrative law model that would suggest that's the way this should be done. Okay, well, I, unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we could keep talking about this for another hour and a half. <laughs> it's such a fascinating topic. And uh, um, so let's uh, thank Jen and Chris the, the Zoom way, I guess, with some Zoom applause. <laughs> and uh, we will uh, see everyone uh, hopefully next week.